Welcome to the June 2020 CCAST of Back to the Future of Collision Repair and how SECA brings all industry segments together. I'm Paul Berry, Executive Director of SECA. The Collision Industry Electronic Commerce Association, or SECA, develops and promotes electronic communication standards that allow the collision industry to be more efficient. We also provide webinars like this one to help educate both members and non-members. Today's presenter, Eric Bickett, has 39 years of experience in the collision industry. He and his partner started Auto Center Auto Body, ACAB, in 1984, now part of Fix Auto USA. They also founded Fix Auto USA, which was sold along with ACAB to Driven Brands in April of this year. Over his career, Bickett has been involved in the establishment of several other companies, including Caliber Collision, and Syncast, a technology company serving thousands of collision repair shops that was later sold to Enterprise Rent-A-Car. In addition, Bickett and his partner set up the Collision Career Institute, an educational organization supporting apprenticeships in the collision industry. Today, Eric will share his insight on the current landscape of the collision repair industry and what changes are expected to happen in the future. As we start the webinar, I want to remind you that there is no verbal communication between the participants and the presenter. If you have questions during the webinar, please type them in the webinar navigation pane on your screen. We will answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. And now, I'll turn it over to Eric. Good morning. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for the opportunity to have this discussion with the participants from the collision industry. Um, today, what, what I'm happy to share my thoughts about our industry and sort of what the technology and te technological advancement that have powered much of the change over the past, over certainly in my in my career and I've, as I've stayed close to technology, and, and largely impacted by Sika and and the work of Sika and the work of the volunteers within Sika. I titled this uh, presentation "Back to the Future" because I'm a big believer that you can look back to predict forward. And, uh, and, and we'll talk a lot about that as I go through uh, my presentation. You know, as I go through this, some of you will say, of course, no duh, I mean, obviously. Some of you might say, uh, that seems anecdotal, not really backed up by facts. But one thing I have learned in all the years I've been in, been in the business, and as I continue to get older, that um, wisdom comes from experience, and I've had a bunch of that. So I've been lucky enough over my career to predict uh, many things that have happened. Uh, the one thing that I'm not very good at is the timing. It seems like I'm always uh, predicting or preparing myself for stuff that isn't happening yet, which kind of puts me on the bleeding edge. But uh, I've enjoyed the career. It's been a great uh, industry and, and enjoyed the time in doing that. I'm sort of, I'm at, I am at the end of my career. But I'm going to stay connected because um, the changes that we're going to see in the next five years, I have no doubt, are going to be more dramatic than the last five. And the last five have been more dramatic than anything I've seen in all the years I've been in the business. I'm going to start start talking about Sika first, um, because the role that that Sika has played as we integrate with the trading partners within the industry has been significant. And I, I my belief is the role that Sika will play in the future is also very important. So I'm going to go back backwards a little bit and talk about the history of Sika. Um, and let's see if I can get control. Okay. But, you know, the story starts back in 1991, um, where basically those of us that were in the, you know, collision repairs or in the business and insurers alike, were just learning how to work together through this new relationship called DRP. Um, and a part of that process was implementing technology that allows us, allowed us to communicate electronically with our insurance partners. But unfortunately, this is kind of what it looks like. If you're Bob's Auto Body back in the early 90s and you wanted to do business with the major insurers, uh, you had to actually subscribe and license to the software and the companies that they interact, that they leveraged uh, for claims handling um, technology and solutions. So Bob's Auto Body would have to subscribe to ADP, CCC, and Mitchell uh, because he wanted to communicate with all the top insurers uh, who were work providers for his business. Unfortunately, uh, because of the three computers, what Bob needed was three estimating systems, three modems, three printers, three license fees, 
three systems to learn. And not just that, but these estimating systems didn't electronically communicate with the management system. So if Bob had a management system, he had typically 45 minutes per estimate to manually enter that into the computer. On top of that, you know, when we sort of I mean, you keep keep in mind that before electronic estimating, I know for many of you, you weren't around then, but for guys like me with a lot of gray hair, we remember when we used to handwrite estimates, we, we just weren't used to having the costs associated with an estimating solution as part of the business expense. And we used to think, you know, when we looked at the cost of these, each of these three systems that we had to buy three, we, we would use this analogy of seemed to us like it was a rotary phone that we had to pay a whole bunch of money for just because when I picked it up, it talked to the insurer that could send me work. If I took the same type of phone with more technology and look at the price of that, it was significantly cheaper. So all of this, all of this that I'm describing ends up with uh, collision repairs and sort of many of us in the business just pulling our hair out. So we decided to do something. And back in 1991, we started talking about how can we work together to make this better? So in the early 90s, the Collision Industry Conference approved a proposal that we submitted uh, to start a new committee, and this committee was called CETUS, which stood for Collision Industry Electronic Data Interchange, inter sorry, Interface Standards. So it was really started, thank goodness, through CIC, which many, which provided many good startups to help support the industry. So we started as a, 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 a committee within CIC, and and I, with a couple of folks on our staff, ran that committee and sort of organized things for the first couple of years. Um, and then right around 1994, we 20 founding companies came together from 17 diverse industry segments that donated their time and money to actually start the 501c6 uh, not-for-profit organization that we know today as SICA. We formed work groups and started working on the problem and, and tried, tried to, to deal, with, deal with the existing problem to come, come up with solutions. We started collaborating things that we'd never done before relative to technology. And we had a lot of very difficult discussions back then as pe people with their specific business strategy had to come together as an industry and make adjustments for the best betterment of all. So some of the early wins that we had was that interoperability that didn't exist with those three systems. For those of you that have a lot of gray hair, you might remember MS-DOS and a, and a configuration called AutoExec.bat, which you know, basically configured the system and prepared it for the estimating solution to launch. Well, the first thing that was solved was these three estimating companies came together, thankfully, and worked together on a solution where they all could coexist on one system, so we didn't need to have those three computer systems. Another early win was what we all know is the EMS standard, and 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 frankly, the EMS standard, EMS stands for elect, or Estimating to Management System Standard, EMS. And it was never designed to be used the way it has been used over the years. It was mostly designed, it was definitely designed just to work within the, the four walls of a collision shop where there was an estimating system and a management system. And then this EMS file would be traded between the estimating system and the management system so that you didn't have to manually key the estimate in. But that EMS standard, as, as we all know, uh, was widely used for many forms of trading, part, trading partner exchange of electronic information in the claims process. So the founding principles of CK, and I'm going to probably beat this with a dead horse because I have it in the presentation three times, really important. Um, and one of the early benefits that we got of these 17 diverse industry segments coming together, we recognize the importance that when it comes to trading information electronically, there are no masters in this. It, it's a non it should be a nonprofit organization whose mission is to facilitate the implementation of electronic commerce, provide a form of methods to develop and maintain objective, unbiased, and uniform electronic commerce standards and guidelines that encourage open competition and free choice and are in the best interest of all entities conducting business within the collision industry. So each segment having an equal voice, super important. So we we started CK and we you know we're a couple years in, and and basically wanted to we wanted to fund all acti all activities through membership, but unfortunately nobody was 
nobody was joining. So the founding members, I, I remember, I don't know if it was two or three or maybe four years, there's probably some people on the call that remember, the founding members, uh, the 20 of us, we, we were rolling forward our membership dues, sometimes two, three years, just to have a budget to continue. So we had to do something. Um, oops. Okay, well, let it just go. So we, we did sort of a controversial move, and some of you will remember this on the phone, where the standards were originally free in, 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 the, in the open domain, we decided to actually charge for the standards. Um, and then uh, we charged more for the standards that it cost to be a member. So we drove membership problem solved. Now CICAS recognizes the electronic standard setting organization for the collision industry. Uh, member companies support and protect its charter. Most recent example, I just have a shout out to CCC. Uh, they reached out to, uh, to CICA and basically um, wanted to confirm that some, tr some of their trading partners were in fact still members and still had license and authorization to use the, use the uh, standards and the in intellectual property. And so basically was able, were able to hold all of those accountable who are using the intellectual property be part of the membership and supporting what's going on. So a shout out for CCC for that. But we've had many examples of that over the years of members supporting the organization, which has been part of the biggest success. You know, there, in terms of statistics, there are a lot of, you know, there's a lot of things that this, this activity has created opportunities, but certainly one of these, which of course it's not entirely from electronic technology, but it's really from integrating the business processes between insurers and repairers and suppliers to allow cycle time to improve at the rate that you're seeing on the screen. It's truly amazing if you think about um, what's happened and uh, with that, that benefits the driving public, uh, the insured that's driving that car. And obviously all, everybody involved because the more efficient it is, uh, uh, the more benefits and, 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 and uh, best for all. So once again, I'm just going to say it again. I said I told you three times. I'll leave Sika just after this for a little while. Objective, unbiased, uniform, open competition, free choice, best interest of all entities conducting business with and within the collision industry. The reason why I'm beating this dead horse is that it's so important in, 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 as we go forward that there are no masters in choosing how we're going to create these standards and, and the methodology of leveraging these messages that are going to go between the trading partners. It really has to be a balanced approach and balanced leadership. So we're going to go back, as I mentioned, back to the future. We're going to go back. And back in 1997, uh, I, we, I went through this exercise where I, I went around to the SICA uh, board members uh, and founders at the time and says, what's possible? What, what's, what's, going, what's the claim like going to going to look like in 10 years? And so I wrote this article. And by the way, this article will be available um, I guess on the SICA website, along with this presentation, you're welcome to read it. It's a little lengthy. I didn't want to read it uh, for the in, in the interest of time uh, on this presentation. But in the article, these are some of the things that we predicted. Some of which, you know, uh, maybe weren't done exactly by 2007, but certainly have been accomplished. Um, so basically, I wrote a story about uh, this woman who had a collision, uh, uh, had an accident on the way to work back in, uh, uh, would have been 2007. And here's some of the things that we predicted. You know, just uh, aside from the industry stuff, we predicted residential storage of energy um, uh, and, and systems to support that. Voice activation on all devices, uh, we all enjoy that now. Video conferencing versus face-to-face. -face. Um, th these may seem like no big deal now, but if you go back to 1997, they were sort of dreaming. Uh, traffic control systems that are live and active. Uh, self-driving vehicles, um, ETA predicting technology uh, and uh, technology to anticipate road conditions, driving conditions, all of those currently obviously available. Vehicles sensing the collision before the driver. I'll talk about that in in present day. Certainly, we 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 have that today. Temptation of drivers to disengage the system. In the story, it talks about that. And certainly, as we think about the technology that's that, that's available in cars for for us collision chefs, we probably secretly don't want anybody hurt, but we sort of count on this because if these cars, you know, and you'll see as I talk a little bit about some of the technology today, if they stay engaged, they we're going to have a whole bunch less accidents. Electronic dispatch for first responders. Uh, electronic dispatch for all claim activity. 
large databases determining cost of repair, parts and materials needed, um, reducing cycle time and, and uh, up to potentially 80% 80, 80 through the integration. So most of this we've seen. Uh, certainly the technology is there for electronic dispatch to first responders and all claims activity. And there's, a, there's been a lot of talk about this you know, database where you're overlaying the manufacturer images on top of the damaged car images and what can potentially happen and we're closer than ever uh, on and that type of thing. But if you look at the things that haven't been accomplished, it certainly isn't from technology. It's really from companies, organizations, and the government all supporting the inter inter interoperability between systems. So I'm gonna talk a little about, about this guy. I, I'm, I'm very passionate about technology, as, you, as most of you that know me know that. And um, over the years, I've always, especially when this anti-collision technology started to enter the mainstream, I wanted to own the cars that had it. And I started with a, I remember what year it was, it was a Infiniti QX56, which at the time had some of the best anti-collision technology. So I bought that, wanted to see what that was all about. And then today I own a 2018 Tesla. And that's what you see on the screen. As a matter of fact, if you look at the dash, uh, in between the steering wheel there, that's actually this weekend. Um, I, I was in a drive through but you can see the Tesla sees the truck on the right and the car in front of it. And I've got, believe it or not, I've got the Tesla activated on, 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 on its auto drive and it will sort of wait for that truck to go forward and pull me right in behind the truck. It's pretty amazing technology. In fact, the latest release that I just got two weeks ago now sees hazard cones and other uh, things on the, on the roadway. It also sees all the lanes on the freeway. Pretty amazing. But this guy, Elon, I mean, I, he's, he's somewhat of my hero um, because he's fearless. Um, he dares to dream and he makes his dreams real. Um, you know, I, these aren't directly his quotes, but the stuff you read about him, you know, he, he, he would say things like, don't tell me why we can't do it. Tell me how we're going to do it. And I mean, this is amazing, the SpaceX, what he did recently. I mean, what is it, two or three years ago, he was out of money, yet he moved forward and somehow was able to produce that booster uh, that booster rocket that landed itself. I mean, along with so many amazing things that he's done, because you just, you don't tell him you can't be done. So if you, if, let's just talk about the Tesla, this Tesla, because I believe, now I don't drive a Volvo. Some of you may drive Volvos. I hear that that technology is pretty amazing too, but this is just tech that's here today. And I think Elon is really paving the way. Um, so this, my Tesla maintains lane control. Uh, what's kind of odd about that is it keeps the car in dead center on the lane. And those of you who are Tesla drivers, you, you know what I'm talking about, which is a little weird because most of us actually like to ride a little bit to the left of the, in the lane. But so it keeps you dead center in the lane. It sees surrounding vehicles and obstacles before before the driver so many times the car has reacted before I've seen it. I'm not sure I would if I hit anything, but it certainly sees stuff before I do. It changes lanes and it actually finds the fastest lane. That was an update from about four months ago. So it looks and is paying attention to traffic around it and it's moving the car into the fastest lane. It will completely navigate from uh, only on freeways, not on, not on city streets yet. That's a release coming soon. I'm pretty excited about it, but it, it'll actually, in fact, if I get into an area like San Diego, if those of you that, that know San Diego downtown, there's a whole bunch of freeways. And if you don't, so when I get into San Diego, I just let the car decide what freeway I'm gonna be on if I'm navigating into San Diego city. And it does that full, very nice. The city streets, it'll come to a full stop and, and it starts. It, it uh, The newest release coming, which I can't wait, it reads and responds to traffic lights and stop signs and does some city city driving, automated city driving. It's got summon, that's a real fun thing to do if you're at a restaurant with some friends and you can I can summon the car as long as it's a private parking lot to come right up and pick me up. Uh, it adjusts the ride uh, and configuration based on its experience in the geography that it's in. It's just amazing um, tech that, that's been implemented. And the, my favorite thing is I get two updates a month. And, there, and when I get in the car and I see I've got an update, that's a pretty exciting day for me. So, you know, as I compare this to other vehicles, I also have a, a 2018 uh, Ford Raptor that's loaded with any, all that Ford does. And what's interesting to me is that Ford has lane control, but it doesn't, it, it, it you know, they, they, they just haven't gone to the place where, where Elon has and keep the car dead center of the lane. It kind of wanders all over the place. And, and I don't know if that's just risk adverse. We'll talk about that later or why, because it seems to me the truck's got what it needs to do to, to emulate some of the stuff I've experienced in the Tesla. So it'd be interesting to watch the other manufacturers as they follow. So I'd like to talk a little bit about COVID. You know, I, it's such a, obviously a time 
it's, it's, it's such an unprecedented event and we're talking about the collision industry. So talk a little bit about COVID because I think COVID, if you're an entrepreneur, there's a silver lining for sure. And I would just, all of us are all are back in the middle of probably gearing our businesses back up. Frankly, uh, we were 55% off and we matched that with 55, 55% of uh, uh, furloughs. And, and so now we're kind of bringing people back and this is a tremendous opportunity for us if you're a true entrepreneur and you find that silver lining. So let me get back here where I'm. So obviously we learned, we learned to work from home uh um in 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 where we learned work from home in ways that we'd never learned that before we broke down silos that were in our business where our businesses are run especially if you're an mso you run these shops as individual shops you know we were doing pick up and drop off drop off but obviously we fine-tuned that curbside service we implemented new technology into the customer experience and the uh photo imaging stuff where customers can basically document the claim from home and you can get everything set up. I mean, we learned how to really implement and leverage that, arrange repair without having direct interaction. Certainly, again, if you're an MSO or part of a group, we, we honed our skills in low level. And in my case, we had two shops that we shut down the production and, and we low leveled everything and just had it, uh, uh, those businesses still open, but for check-in only. We eliminated basically geographical barriers when you think about it, and we leveraged shared resources more than we'd ever done before with the furloughs. So what did we learn? I mean, the most important thing I would say to all the entrepreneurs on this phone is the worst thing you could do as COVID, as, as, the, as the business comes back is not take those learnings, those things that you had to do out of the necessity of the unprecedented event, take those learnings and implement them. Because before, many of the things that we learned as we went through this, we just weren't brave enough to try when we had a functioning business going 100 miles an hour. So uh, that, that would be my message is think about what you did and take the best out of it. And I know you will if, if you're an entrepreneur. Uh, I know you're already well on your way to doing that. So I'm going to make some predictions about the future. Um, I already talked a little bit about my personality and sort of, you know, what gets me going. But general premise for predictions, as I already said, is looking at the past. But logically reasoning of them here, the here at humanitarian needs and looking at sort of stati statistics. Um, and I put all that together and I've, I've got some predictions I'll share with you. And I, but but uh, again, general premise, automation drives predictability. Uh, predictability drives efficiencies and lowers friction and cost. We were all blessed with free will, and we know our customers demand choice, and the, solution, the solutions must offer choice. Solutions that solve and address human need will win. Boy, that's a, that's a lesson that I've learned in life. Pretty much anything that I'm doing, if it's not solving human need, it's got less chance of, of, of successful implementation. Real-time customer experience feedback will drive most decisions. So, you know, CSI is much different. While we're still doing a lot of CSI, all of you, uh, you know, know the importance of that customer feedback and how our customers depend on that so much from those who have had experience with the business and paying attention to that. The most efficient, complete solution at the lowest cost that supports human need will win. So, I mean, I, that's always been a gauge for me if I'm trying something new. If it passes that sniff test, then we just keep going. And it doesn't mean it's not gonna fail. And we just try to learn from those failures and keep going. And ultimately that solution will win. So w one of the predictions I have, and this is probably a no duh prediction, uh, EVs will enjoy significant growth in the 10 year in 10 years. The stuff, if you do the research on it, they'll say by uh, uh, 2040, we should be at 58%. Um, I think in 10 years, we'll be over 40% of the vehicles on the road. So, I mean, I think all of us know that this is coming very, very quickly. But if you drive an EV, you know why. As I said, I think I might have said, if you buy a Tesla, you won't buy any other car. Um, uh, but if you drive an EV, you'll know why. Lower maintenance, reduced brake servicing because of regenerative braking, uh, much better handling because of low center of gravity, much less moving parts, a simpler design. Lower cost of propulsion. This one's kind of this one's kind of strange to me. I don't know how this is going to work out. I've tried to measure um, the use of electricity in my car, and I have not been able to identify a cost yet. I mean, every once in a while, I've had to go away from the Tesla superchargers that I get for free, and 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 go with an aftermarket kind of charging solution. So that's about the only time I've ever paid for propulsion in this car. 
Um, what's interesting to me in the state of California, I think we're at $2.50 a gallon in tax. So who knows how that's all going to get handled in the future. Um, and, but the other thing, uh, I don't know if it's like this in the other EVs. I should probably do some research on that. But, but, but obviously, uh, my car is constantly being up updated and enhancements are created as long as the base platform has the ability of taking those enhancements. So I see significant growth, significant growth with EV and should be, better get ready for it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about insurance in, insurance companies um, uh, and insurance. I think that's going to, I think we all see that that, that landscape's changing very quickly. Um, but I've got some predictions, some of which have come from discussions that I've had with actual insurers, some of the real strategic thinkers and insurance companies. But um, first thing I'll say, and this again should be kind of a no duh, but I'm just going to say it. And I've been saying it to our, our own people for a couple of years now. Uh, insurers in the, in the very near future are only going to refer vehicles to those repairs who are certified and verified to have the equipment, training, um, to perform the repairs, certified and verified. Not only do we have the equipment and the training, um, but we know how to use it and we know how to conduct the repairs and that must be verified. It absolutely has to happen. It surprises me it hasn't happened yet. I, pres I presume it's because there's just not enough certified, certified repair facilities to get the job done, but, but I think the risks are so high. With this technology, that's coming at us at, at like a tsunami, uh, it, it, the, the risks are so high to not have that sort of step in the process. Um, the car build and the driving behavior will be a large factor in underwriting insurance policies. Um, this will give the manufacturer significant competitive advantage. So if you think about it, um, if you, my Tesla uh, absolutely can eliminate a majority of the collisions on its own. Now, frankly, my Tesla still, two weeks after I bought the car, I was at my son's condo and I was backing up. My wife was sitting next to me and she always cracks up about me and technology. And I'm backing up and I run into the wall. So she says, wow, um, that shouldn't happen. But I, of course, ran into the wall because I defeated the warning uh, by having my foot on the accelerator. One of the things that is interesting to me, and I don't know what the answer is, perhaps if you're on the phone and you do and you wanna make a comment or send, send me an email, I'd love to know. Why, if the car can stop itself from crashing, does it let the driver override the ability to stop the crash? I don't know that. Probably a little bit better for us now, as long as nobody gets hurt, because we get to fix the car. But I think that's going to be overcome at some point. And certainly, um, you know, if you're Elon Musk, I don't think you want that Tesla rated next to a Corvette, but uh, I don't know, or a car. Let's just pick a car that has a lot less anti-collision technology. And perhaps that's why he's experimenting now uh, with an insurance company himself so that he has the car built. He knows, he, you know, that car is constantly by the millisecond sending data to the, to the Tesla servers. He knows where the car is, how fast the inertia, what the build is. And I just, uh, you know, even an insurer, as I mentioned, strategic invert insurer told me once that gives them significant competitive advantage in underwriting insurance policies. Uh, so I believe manufacturers will help under, underwrite uh, and rate policies and partner with insurers to provide claim services. You know, insurers are good at claim services. They've done it a long time. I see insurers and manufacturers partnering where they're a little bit at odds now, but I think that'll all get worked out. Manufacturers, although, will have absolute influence in the settlement of claims through direct through their direct relationship with the car owner. I know we've all been talking about this a long time with OnStar, but there's just no question this is going to happen. So let's talk a little bit about uh, auto body. Propose, I suppose we have probably a lot of body shop folks on the phone. Some, some, some of my predictions on this. Um, as I said, uh, uh, I believe this technology will eliminate a large percentage of the larger collisions. When I'm on the roadway going down the road, my car will stop, can stop almost any accident. Now, perhaps when I'm going through the traffic light, it can't see the guy that might broadside me, but maybe it can because it can see six lanes over on the freeway. So, um, so I predict that as time goes forward, we will still have the bumper, you know, the stuff in the parking lot where somebody bumps into you and the small stuff that, can't, that, that isn't avoided. And we're gonna need a lot of that, but I think the larger collisions will go down per capita. Um, humans will override the system. That's gonna be the X factor. Will we have someday 
a, a lane like we do have in California, what we call diamond lanes? Will we have an autom automated car driving lane? I think so, where the cars in that lane are, are, are on autopilot and they're not being disengaged by the driver and only the cars that are there that can communicate with each other. There'll be, there's got to be some segmentation. As I said, human beings want choice. And if you want, as a human being, to override the system, and I'll tell you, when I'm on the freeway with, with my car, um, and I've got it on Navigate, it is a little boring. Um, because when I, you know, if it's got an off-ramp uh, that it needs to make in the far left lane, it starts making lane changes to two miles or two and a half miles before that off-ramp. Well, I, I can do that in a quarter of a mile, right? Especially with a Tesla. So human beings will override the systems. Manufacturers will throttle the release of technology through their legislative hurdles and risk adverse strategies. So as I said, the technology is out there to do a lot more than these cars are doing. It's gonna be throttled by the things that I've just mentioned. Incentives will be implemented to encourage drivers to behave. Again, drivers have choice, but let's give them incentives. And we already see that, uh, you know, obviously, with with uh, the, the uh, um, uh, commercials that we see from insurers that have deployed sort of driving behavior apps and that type of thing. So absolutely, uh, that's going to be part of underwriting the claim is how the drivers uh, uh, drive. Um, segmentation in, uh, of the severity of vehicle and vehicle type will be a rule rather than the exception. I mean, if you think about what we as repairers have done to lower cost, how much further can we go to lower cost? Uh, one of the ways that you can become a bunch more efficient is segmentation. So today, uh, you know, today in my uh, collision shops that, that I used to own that I'm still involved with, uh, we fix every car uh, with a couple exceptions, pretty much every type of car. Now we have done some segmentation by severity and that's proven to be very effective, but there's a lot of efficiencies gained. For example, I mean, the easiest example I can give you is if Bob's auto body, you want to turn him into a Ford shop, don't send him any other cars but Fords. Give him about six months, he's going to be pretty darn good fixing, fixing Fords. So uh, segmentation um, is, is absolutely the next step for, for repairs to gain, gain competitive advantage. Electronic tr uh, uh, automatic transfer of data uh, collected by the vehicle will alert stakeholders. This is an interesting one. Obviously, there's a lot of discussion about who owns the data and what data is actually being collected by the black box. But back to my story about Julie, I do believe we will have someday the cars talking to this traffic system that I propose and, and passing information on to accelerate, as if you read the story, it's about, it's about accelerating the whole process of the cycle time of the whole process, starting from the accident, the police, the tow truck, the repair, et cetera. And I do believe that will happen, maybe not 10 years, but it's gonna be interesting to watch how the industry, and I think SICA can have a very big part of that. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Larger collision repairs will have significant advantage over individual independence. Um, I think most of us probably know that, but I, it's going to accelerate along with the changes in the business. Single shop owners on their own in metro markets operating by themselves won't survive. You, unless you're fixing, you know, unless you are in a very, what do you call it? Uh, um, if you picked a, a, a specialized market, like maybe tractors or something or, you know, a very, very specialized market. I think if you're on, if you're a single shop in a metro market, it's going to be difficult to survive. Uh, franchising will grow in market share to match consolidators. Certainly, as 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 those of you know, you listen to my bio. I've been in the franchising business for more than 20 years, along with the collision business, longer than that. And um, and frankly, I see over the next five years just explosive growth for franchising. Uh, for a lot of reasons, and for any of those of you that would like to talk about that, I could I could share that with you. But so if you're an independent shop in a metro market, I guess the message is pay attention and take a look, and you better join something that's giving you, giving you some more scale in order to compete and survive. Measurement will expose and enable the most efficient repair solution, mitigating the inefficiency of perceived savings. I won't go into that very much, but for the collision repairs on the phone, you might uh, know what I'm talking about. The bottom line is back to in the beginning of this thing, I said uh, the, the, the best solution, the most efficient, efficient solution that's providing for human need will win. So a lot of things that we do in the claims handling process as a repair, you'll, you'll know this, you kind of scratch your head and go, why are they telling me to do this? That's really not pr providing what they're after. Those things over time will go away. 
over uh, will go away. And frankly, part of that will come from this concept of risk sharing. I mean, we already see that with a couple of insurers um, now where average cost is certainly one of the KPIs we're paying attention to and in some cases may even have incentive for average costs. I know we got to be careful with that one. But risk sharing, I think, will drive out some of those inefficiencies, some of those things that we're doing that just make no sense uh, relative to the outcome that the stakeholders would be interested in. So um, cycle time and touch time will become virtually the same. Uh, so, frankly, we've seen, as you saw, uh, remember the slide earlier, dramatic uh, change from the early 90s to today. But, you know, we've said for years that touch time on, on average is three days, and uh, um, it may be a little bit better than that now with some equipment and that kind of thing. But, but we're, you know, my prediction is, is touch time and cycle time are going to become virtually the same over, over the next uh, 10 years. Okay, talk a little bit about in the future what I think about retailing, retailing automobiles, um, and you know again this is just my opinion watching things, but I think this idea of a mausoleum dealership, this multi-million dollar beautiful location with 500 uh, cars on the pavement that the dealer is flooring, and and making all that inventory available to the to the the potential car buyer is way too expensive. And I think that over time will change. And obviously, I'm showing a picture of Carvana, which is not a new car dealer, but you get the idea in terms of how Carvana and some of the other use uh, big uh, multi locate multi uh, uh, geography used car dealers are are building their business. So I, you know, and I think the next generation um, is going to be much more apt to order vehicles. And you know, it's kind of like going an iPhone. You if you want to see the newest newest Apple stuff, you go to the Apple store and you you pick up the phone, you touch it, feel it, and play with it, and ask questions about it. But once you understand it, then if you had to buy one, you would just order one. And there are a lot of examples. In fact, Tesla is a good example of that. Um, you know, got you got Tesla new cars in a in South Coast Plaza or in a in, in Fashion Island or, or, or a, a shopping mall. Uh, new vehicle uh, startups will disrupt the new deal new new car dealer segment. We're already seeing some of that on the EV side. I think that uh, this. My opinion, my humble opinion, I think this retailing of cars needs to be disrupted, and I think it will be disrupted, and I think we're seeing some early examples of the potential of that. Legacy automakers who don't who don't make the adjustments um, will lose significant market share as a prediction. Manufacturers will expand and decouple referral relationships, and body shops will appreciate this thought. Many uh, will expand and decouple the referral relationships between auto dealers and body shops. For those of you who do dealer work or you know, certainly market in that area and operate a body shop, you know what I'm talking about. Many times the referral, the person referring the car at the dealership, uh, referring the customer from the dealership to go to a shop, isn't really thinking about whether it's certified and where the car is getting done properly. There's some other economic uh, incentives in there that are causing that referral relationship. And I think that's the, 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 the manufacturers that I've spoken about understand this and understand it's a problem. And I think this problem will be mitigated. Ride sharing, uh, ride sharing will enjoy rapid expansion. The increase in demand of the cost savings and time saving transport will absolutely drive this market. Independent used car solutions will only survive in secondary markets where large used car solutions are not implemented. If you bought a car at CarMax, I've never done anything with Carvana, but I did the CarMax thing. And of course, being in the automotive business and actually being part of a dealer for many, many years, it's a completely different process. And while they, when they started, it was a little clunky, uh, they've really worked out some pretty good systems. And I think that's going to cause that prediction there. Um, I think that's it for, for the manufacturers. So, uh, so I'm going to talk a little about Sika, what I think Sika ought to be doing in the future. And I, I'm just going to say this and, you know, in the, in the late nineties, um, I, really tried to push the organization to do this. And I know there's a lot of dynamics. I, I wish on the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, you know, I wish that SICA had been able to cert create or, or create a registry to support the industry, basically support electronic transactions that would certify interfaces against standard trade, tra you know, help support trading transactions, su uh, su supported and troubleshoot those connecti connectivity and trading partner connections, uh, provide education, implementation. Of course, unlikely to happen because uh, a, a exchange like that um, 
uh, has controls so much potential power, uh, and I don't think the companies that are that are in the business would be comfortable. But I think essentially we're going to end up with something like that, and that could be a company that's got significant market share. And if you got enough market share, you're sort of doing that. And we see some examples potentially now. And frankly, the business, these businesses that are uh, are involved in Sika are, are are behaving well and very very supportive. But I just throw that out there for the people that are on the phone from Sika as you, as we continue to evolve. And I'll talk a little bit at the end about what I think Sika ought to be doing. Um, so uh, the only thing I'll say there is that, and I you know I am a technologist, but I haven't kept on up as much as I probably should, but I think there's a, at the end of the day, the applications themselves and the the application interfaces that are built are gonna sort a lot of this stuff out. Um, a member technology uh, solution provider should support and demonstrate the kind of support as recently done by CCC. And um, frankly, uh, again, I'm just gonna say, it's super important, I would say, going forward that we maintain this original premise that we founded Seek on ob objective, unbiased, uniform, open, free choice, best interest of all entities in the collision industry. That's my wish and 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 uh, suggestion to Sika. Well, I got through that pretty good. So at the very least, uh, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, I would recommend that the this industry assembles leaders uh, to dare to dream and sort of define the future. You know, Farzam uh, with Verifax had, has done a lot of work in this area, but I think that the leaders should get together and define the future relative to electronic commerce and how we could potentially uh, make that, perhaps that story that I wrote or something similar to that. What, what can we do in the future to shrink the cycle time of the claim, to drive more value for consumers driving the cars, the insured drive, drivers and drive more value for all the participants. How are we going to do it rather than tell me why it can't be done? So with that, um, I'm finished and uh, a little early. Hopefully I didn't go too fast. And I don't know if there's any questions, Paul. I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate it. Uh, that was really good information. And uh, Eric mentioned that he wrote an article a number of years ago, and we will have that posted on the SIGA website uh, later today or by tomorrow at the latest. And I would encourage you to read it. I read it uh, recently and was I was pretty impressed with uh, how forward thinking it was at the time. Um, I'd like to turn it over now to Stacy Phillips. Uh, she's Sika's marketing director and has been monitoring the webinar for questions. Uh, Stacy, have we received any questions? No, Paul, we haven't received any questions, but we thank Eric for an excellent presentation and all of your insight and and I echo Paul in the encouraging everyone to read the great article that Eric wrote, which will be posted on the website, along with the recording of the Sika cast and the slides. Okay. Um, and so if anybody has questions and you'd like to submit one now on the uh, uh, message panel there, please feel free to do so. Yeah, anybody who's got, like, uh, I'm interested with, other people's thought about some of the things I talked about, or perhaps even additional thoughts since we have a couple of minutes. If not, you can see my email address at the bottom. I, I love anybody would, that would challenge or provide additional insight, you know, to sort of help as we sort of prepare ourselves for the future. Uh, please uh, use that email address. You can send it to me directly. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, please don't forget to check Sika.com for a full schedule of future broadcasts and watch recordings of past webinars. Uh, links are available under the Ccast tab at the top of the page. Sika has partnered with the Automotive Management Institute. Attendees of this webinar are eligible to receive credit toward a professional designation from AMI. And after taking a short quiz on its website, a link will be sent to all attendees. And please follow SICA social media platforms to stay up to date on upcoming events and SICA news.
And with that, this concludes today's webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.